<clears throat> Hello, this is David Bridges, um, MEEN 3335, Intro to Unmanned Aircraft Systems, Unit 3, Lecture 1, UAS Controls. And what we're going to be doing in this lecture is introducing the concepts and technologies used to control unmanned aircraft. We're going to look at the, the fundamental principle <clears throat> of most control systems today, which are feedback control systems. And then we're going to look at some of the sensors that are used that basically provide input to these control systems. Um, global positioning system, MEMS, accelerometers, and rate gyroscopes, how they work. So that's what we're going to be doing uh, in this lecture. So automatic controls have been around for a while, like we saw in one of the earlier lectures. Uh, the autopilot's been around since, you know, the 1910s. Um, and many aircraft today have automatic controls to maintain heading, altitude, and so forth. When you fly long distances on a commercial airliner, typically there's an autopilot engaged to maintain altitude, to maintain heading, speed. Um, now, sometimes there are actually additional commands built into those autopilots. Um, the optimal cruise program for a commercial airliner is something called cruise climb, where you would um, basically just, as the fuel burned off, the altitude would gradually increase. Well, most air, uh, controlled airspace, the controllers don't like that. They want to keep airplanes at constant altitudes. So they will do a stair step. So for example, a transatlantic flight will do a stair step where they'll fly at a certain altitude and then climb a little bit, fly at a certain altitude, so forth. Uh, this is an approximation to the cruise climb, and that climb schedule can be built into the autopilot. Um, <clears throat> we talked about the unmanned aircraft that have the, uh, that can fly a certain distance in a straight line, basically back to the Model 147A, the, one of the first reconnaissance drones uh, could do that. Now, it's expected that <clears throat> at some point, manned aircraft, We'll have autopilots program from takeoff to landing. Um, this is the no pilot on board kind of thing. Sounds a little bit uh, out there, but if you look at the statistics of aircraft accidents, uh, particularly um, general aviation small airplanes, the vast majority is pilot error. So it's not a failure of the system or the aircraft, it's a failure of the pilot. So, so things could be heading that direction. Now, just one example, uh, the space shuttle presumably could land com completely autonomously. It could you know, come down, put the gear down, land. Um, it never did it because every single time it landed, and it was something like roughly 200 landings, the pilot always took over at the end and landed it. Basically, one of my... Uh, faculty members when I was a student uh, once said, who worked on the shuttle program said that basically no pilot wanted to be the one who left his hands off the stick the whole time. So every single time the uh, <clears throat> pilots uh, took over manual control and landed it. But it did supposedly have that capability of automatic landing. Um, now, <clears throat> what makes unmanned aircraft distinct uh, is that many of them are programmed <clears throat> to have the ability to take off, fly their missions, land completely automatically. Um, no human intervention at all. Push a button, the thing takes off, does its things, come back, lands, and no manual inputs the whole time. <clears throat> okay. Now, so if we're still looking at manned aircraft, uh, why do they have the autopilots? Well, one thing is to basically reduce pilot workload. If you're flying transatlantic flight, it could be eight, nine hours. If you're going to Australia or Tokyo, it could be even longer, 12 hours, 16 hours, something like that. So to just stand there and hold, uh, sit there and hold the stick or hold the yoke for that long, <laughs> that can get pretty old. So. They put in attitude control systems to maintain pitch, roll, or heading. Um, that's just keep it pointed in a certain direction. Altitude control systems to maintain a desired altitude because that can happen. If, if you just let a plane fly and burn as it burns off fuel, 
you don't change the power setting, it will gradually climb. <clears throat> you can have a speed control system if you want to maintain a constant speed or constant Mach number. Okay. Um, so that's one thing to have. <clears throat> to have an autopilot is to reduce pilot workload. Another is stability to augmentation systems. Some, most airplanes, if you build them correctly, they're inherently stable. And this goes back to the paper airplane uh, uh, example I used uh, earlier in the semester. You can fold up a paper airplane and throw it, and it will fly pretty much straight, you know, maintain, nose up kind of thing. Um, it's stable. Some aircraft are marginally stable just because the way they're built. Uh, most fighter aircraft are designed to be marginally stable because that makes them maneuverable, okay? Um, well, if they're marginally stable or unstable, then you basically have to have some kind of automatic control to make the platform stable. Uh, and that's what a stability augmentation system does. Um, so if you add this control system, it will ensure that the airplane has the appropriate handling qualities. Um, generally what happens when it's, when it's unstable is that it will start to oscillate. And the oscillations, the amplitudes will get bigger and bigger. Well, the stability augmentation system basically adds damping. So you have a roll damper, pitch damper, or yaw damper. Um, <clears throat> I was involved in a wind tunnel test at NASA Langley when I was a student in 1985. And they were testing the EA-6B, the intruder. This was the electronic warfare version, manned aircraft. But they had a model and a wind tunnel. And they had put so many electronic packages on it and changed the center of gravity location so much that it was basically no longer stable. And it had to have a stability augmentation system. So they were flying this thing. They had the stability augmentation system on. Uh, for the last test, they decided to cut it off and see what would happen. So they tried flying this model in the wind tunnel. It was a free flight model. There was a hose that came down from the ceiling that basically pushed air through the through the duct in the airplane to simulate the uh, jet, the power, and then the wind tunnel was on. So that was the, you know basically represented the forward flight. And so the thing would fly freely in the wind tunnel. And when they turned off the stability augmentation system, it went bananas. It basically diverged, um, and they had to shut down the tunnel. This thing was bashing up against the walls and everything. But that was an example of an aircraft that had become unstable because of modifications to the design, and therefore they had to have a stability augmentation system to be able to fly it. Then the last reason to have an automatic control on a manned aircraft is a landing aid. Um, there are some systems, a glide slope control system, when you're landing, it will bring you in on the right glide slope, bring you in to the, to the end of the runway, and then you, you land. Uh, a localizer to line you up to make sure you're pointing in the right direction down the runway. Uh, and then a flare control system, okay. Um, the airplane comes in to land, the nose comes up, it flares. It's basically a stall right above the ground and it's just, so it just drops gently onto the ground. Okay? So these are the, the reasons why automatic controls are already present in manned aircraft. And now it's just a matter of extending these to unmanned aircraft. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is give you kind of a very brief introduction to the topic of feedback control systems, just so you get an idea of what they are, um, how they operate. Okay, so control, basic principle, make the airplane do something automatically. Okay, you want to maintain altitude, you want, basically you want to do something automatically, but it doesn't do it by itself. It has to be controlled. Okay. There are two types of ways of doing it. There's open loop control and closed loop control. Now open loop, if you know the system response to an input completely, then open loop, open loop, open loop works. You all, all you have to do is issue the command to make it do what you want it to. Uh, you may be familiar with the lead screw. Basically you have a a screw that turns and there's a little tray or, or carriage or something on that screw, you know, riding on a rail. And as you turn the screw, that carriage moves back and forth on the rail. Okay. Well, that's very, very precise. If you know 
the number of turns per inch, what's called the pitch of the screw. You could say, I know that if I turn this thing 20 times, the the tray, the carriage is going to move an inch. All right. So um, if I move it, turn it 10 times, it's going to move half an inch. So, far. so it's very, very precisely known. So I, if I give it the right number of turns, it's going to move a certain distance. Okay. Question is, an open loop system, how do you know the system's done it? You give the command, but how do you know the carriage actually moved an inch or a half inch or whatever? You really don't. You have to assume that everything worked. That's the, that's the drawback of an open loop control system. Okay, and you see here, basically what you, what you see at the bottom of this figure is um, what's called a block diagram. This represents a control system. So you have the input signal, and that goes, so that's basically the command to tell the system to do something. Then the controller takes that command and puts it into a signal that then goes to the system. And then the system does what it's told to do, or presumably it's told to do. But that's it. You, you don't know if it actually did it or not. Now, that's opposed to a closed loop control. All right. So... The input signal, you see the block diagram at the bottom, the input signal is what you want it to do. You want it to get to a certain point. All right. Well, so if you look at the other end, you have the output signal. That's what the system has actually done. So you feed back, you feed that back, and that the thing at the uh, at the beginning, that circle with the X in it, is the is a summer called a summer because it sums the two signals. And so what comes out is something called the error signal. Okay. Um, now that's just the error signal. Signal is the difference between what you told it to do and what it actually did. All right. So what you want to do is you want to make the error zero, right? Because you you want it to do what you told it to do. <laughs> so if it's done what you told it to do, then the error is zero. So the system, the controller now is set up basically to force that error to be zero, to make the system do whatever it's going to do, in order to make the the error zero. So it sends the actuation signal to the system and then that sends the output. But now you are measuring what the system has actually done. You're comparing it to what you wanted it to do and your system is set up to basically drive that error to zero so that it's done what you've told it to do. Okay. Now the issue here is now things get more complicated because in order to do this, you have to know how the system responds to different in, uh, inputs, particularly what are called standard inputs, such as step functions. So if I, if I tell the system go from 0 to 10 instantaneously, how does the system actually respond? Does it take a couple of seconds? You know, what, does it overshoot? That kind of thing. So you have to, to design the controller properly you have to know the response of the system to the different actuation signals. That's closed loop control. Okay, now this is um, what's called a feedback control system because you're feeding back the output to look to compare it with the uh, input. Okay, <clears throat> so this the diagram here is a more general um, expression of the feedback control. So you have the command or reference input, uh, and then that summer is also called a comparator because it's, you're comparing the input to the output, generates the error signal, <clears throat> and then you have the four path elements. Okay, so this is the stuff going <clears throat> forward to the system and to the, you know, to the output, but then at, at the output stage, you bring back the signal, and then you might do things to the signal. It may not be just the signal itself. It may be, you may do some stuff to it. So you have the forward path elements, you have the feedback elements. Um, and what you want to do is you want to make sure that, okay, so you're, you're designing this control system to control something. We want to make sure the controller itself is stable. Okay, so it doesn't drive the system out of control. All right, now, you have an automatic control system in your house. The thermostat on your air conditioner or your heater is an automatic control system. So let's say it's, it's set to air conditioning, okay? The temperature rises till it gets above the temperature you've set it at, air conditioner comes on, the um, 
temperature drops, there's a, the thermostat basically measures the temperature. When it gets back below the, the target temperature or the set temperature, air conditioner shuts off. <clears throat> okay. Now, generally, we run them either air conditioner or heater. Don't run them both. <clears throat> but imagine if you had both on all the time. So say I wanted to keep the house at 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Well, if it gets to 74, air conditioner comes on. Temperature starts dropping. All right. Well, if it gets below 72, okay, that's the target temperature. Well, let's say it drops to 71. Air conditioner shuts off. The heat comes on. Okay, because you want it 72, so it's going to push the heat back up to, to 72. Well, maybe it overshoots. Maybe it goes up to 73. All right, the heater shuts off, the air conditioner comes on, pushes it back down. If the system is stable, eventually you get to that final equilibrium temperature, and both air conditioner and heater are off. Okay, that would be the stable thing. And then there's measurement if the you know external heating or cooling or whatever. But you can imagine in a case like that where the system might go unstable. Okay, you've got the, let's say the, the temperature um, drops for whatever reason. Say you have it 72 and temperature drops to 71. All right, well, heater comes on. Well, the heater maybe drives it up to 73. Heater shuts off, air conditioner comes on. Maybe the air conditioner pushes it down to 71. And the heater comes on, pushes it up to 74. So you see, it, would, it might be possible, given the characteristics of your house, of the, the rate at which the air conditioner cooled and the heater heated, uh, it might be possible for that system to become unstable. And the temperature fluctuations would just keep getting bigger and bigger rather than becoming smaller and smaller. Okay? And so when you design the control system, you want to make sure the control system itself is stable, that it's not going to drive your, your system nuts. Okay, so if we go back a second, you'll see that all of these signals you see uh, R of S or little r of T, capital E of S or little e of T, okay? T in this case represents time, all right? But we're interested, you know, I just told you about, you know, the temperature going up and down, up and down. Well, that's a function of frequency, okay? And so Generally, when you're talking about control systems, you talk about them in the frequency domain, when you're trying to analyze them to see if they're stable or not. So you take all these functions that are functions of time, and you transform them using the Laplace transform into frequency domain functions. So f of t becomes f of s. s is the Laplace variable. It can be complex. If you get into more complicated Laplace transforms, you can actually get more complicated or complex uh, S values with real and imaginary parts. And so, so what you what you try to do once you've done that is that you create this transfer function, which is basically the ratio of the output to the input in the S domain. Okay. And then you want to find the poles and the zeros. So the poles will be where the denominator of the transfer function goes to zero, because anytime the denominator goes to zero, things blow up. The zeros would be where the numerator goes to zero, and those are stable conditions. Basically, you know, nothing's happening. So you want to find the poles, <laughs> because that's where things are going to blow up, and you want to find the zeros, because that's where things are stable. All right. <clears throat> So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about just response, okay, just res uh, a, a controlled response to an input, all right? So I've got, and so this is a very simple system. It's a mass hanging by a spring of systems K, mass M. And so what I want to do is I want to raise the mass a distance of one foot, okay? So I've got the support, and I'm going to move it up one foot. All right, now imagine if I do this very, very slowly, the mass will just move up as a support does, okay? And eventually you know, it'll settle down and it'll still be one and a half, the mass will still be one and a half feet below the support location, all right? So I'm just shifting the mass up, all right? But imagine I do it quickly. Imagine I take the support and I shift it up one foot quickly. What's the mass going to do? Well, the mass 
is going to oscillate, right? It's going to go up and down, up and down, up and down, eventually decay because there will be some damping uh, because of air resistance and so forth. Um, but that oscillatory motion is the response of the system to an input. So the input is changing the support location. The oscillations are the response, right? So this is what the system response might look like, right? So, so this is the output. So you can think of this as the, the mass location relative to where it was initially. All right. So this is the, and this is a very general plot. It's a response of a second order system, which is a system governed by a second order differential equation to a step input. Okay, so that example I just gave, where I move the, the support up one foot, that's a step input. I do it instantaneously. And then the mass will oscillate and eventually because of friction, air resistance, and all that kind of stuff, it will eventually decay. All right, so the input is a unit step. I shift the support up one foot, you know, instantaneously, and then you see how the thing responds. So you've got all these different characteristics. There's a, you know, first of all, it's going to overshoot. So there's a certain maximum overshoot. Um, there's a time for that. Um, when it's up to 90% of the final equilibrium value, that's considered the rise time. Um, when it gets below 5% of the final equilibrium position, that's the settling time. How long does it take to do that? Okay. Now, eventually that mass will stop vibrating and it will be at its new system. That's the, the new steady state. Okay. So everything that happens in between, what you're seeing in this plot is the, um, the transient response. Okay. So it's not a permanent response. Um, it, you know, it comes and it goes. So it oscillates for a while, then it stops. That's considered the transient response. Okay. So, what we, so let's suppose now we don't we don't just move the the mass, but we do something to control how the mass responds to the motion. Okay, so now we want to put in something, some kind of active component of the system that will basically, you know, try to try to keep those oscillations as small as possible, and so that they die out as soon as possible. Okay, so we're going to add an active controller. However. So I'm not going to go into the details of what the controller looks like. I just want to see, I want to, I want to talk about three particular kinds of controllers and look at the effect they have on the response. Okay. The first type of controller is what's called a proportional controller. Um, the control input is, is proportional to the error signal. Okay, so where the mass is supposed to be, where it is, the controller is you know, if the if the difference is big, the controller input is big. If the distance is small, the controller input is small. Okay. Um, now, so you know, you see how it basically, you know, in this case, an active control would force things down to to rest. But notice it doesn't settle down at one; it settles down at about 0.72 or something like that. Um, that's called steady state error, okay? Uh, that's, and that's just something that a proportional controller is subject to. Uh, if you have just a proportional controller where the, where the control input is proportional to the error signal, and that's it, then yeah, you can cause it to settle down at a particular state, but it may not be the state that you want, okay? So you get the steady state error, okay? Well, we can, we can fix that a little bit. We can add what's called an integral controller. Okay. And so now the output of the integral controller is proportional to the accumulated error, not just the, the instantaneous error at any given instant, but the total error that's been accumulated over time. And so, and again, the input is you're trying to drive that accumulated error to zero. All right, so you see then so the, the input is proportional to the integral of the error, okay? So the steady state error goes away. Notice it's oscillating, and it's gonna eventually settle down at one, but notice there's a lot more oscillations. It takes a lot more time to, um, to settle down, all right? This controller adds a pole, which increases the instability. Doesn't necessarily say that the controller is unstable, 
but it's less stable. Okay, so it, you do have a pole, so you have more oscillations. It takes longer to settle down. All right, <clears throat> so then we add a third controller, a uh, derivative controller, where the output is proportional to the derivative of the error, or how fast the error is changing. Okay, now this does a couple of things. One thing is, <clears throat> well, basically, anytime the error is changing quickly, the controller input is larger trying to get rid of the quick changes, okay? And so initially, it will provide large corrections before the error becomes large. Um, now, if the error turns out to be constant, the output is zero. If the error is not changing with respect to time, then a proportional uh, derivative controller doesn't do anything. <laughs> because if DEDT is equal to zero, then the, the control input from the derivative controller is zero, okay? Susceptible to noise. Now, I'm not showing a specific example of this here, but generally what they do then is they combine all three of these into a single, what's called a PID controller, a proportional integral differential controller, <clears throat> or a proportional integral derivative controller. Okay. So you have basically all three. And you wind up with something that looks like this. You see that there's some overshoot, but it's quickly damped out. Uh, there's no accumulated error, no steady state error, and the response you know, does uh, settle down fairly quickly. Okay? So this would be the, the PID control, but notice there are still some oscillations, there's still, still, there is still some overshoot, so forth, okay? so that then might require further tuning. All right, so this is, this is the very, very basics of feedback control systems, these types of controllers. All right, so now I'm just going to look at some examples of how these things get implemented, and we're not going to do a lot of details. I'm just going to kind of show some cartoons, show some <clears throat> just some kind of basic discussions of how they're implemented. Uh, and one is a servo motor, okay? So you have a motor that raises or lowers flaps or moves an elevator, raises or lowers the elevator, moves a, rot a rudder left or right, that kind of thing, all right? So, um, so you're going to use that to control the flap of the airplane, either the rudder, the aileron, or the, or the elevator, okay? Um, well, first of all, you got to know how the motor responds, okay? You've got to know if you give the motor an input, how is it going to respond, right? So the figure on the left at the bottom, is the model of the motor response. Um, basically has a double pole at zero, um, the motor itself. Um, the, um, the motors is, you, you use the servo motor because you want to move the elevator a certain angle. You want to rotate it through a certain angle, all right? So the output is theta. Well, there's rate feedback if you take that theta and multiply it by S, that's basically the equivalent of taking a derivative in the in the Laplace domain. Okay, so so that's the feedback, and so this is the model of the motor. Okay. Now, but remember, I'm using that to control a control surface on the airplane, a rudder, an aileron, or an elevator. Okay. So what I'm really interested in is the angle of that particular flap. All right. So I have to take the, the motor model and stick it into the model of the flap. Because <laughs> you know, I'm sending a control input to set the flap angle, whether it's elevator, rudder, or aileron. Those are all considered flaps. If I want to set the flap angle to a particular value, I'm using a servo motor to do it. So I need to send a control because I want the flap angle to be a certain amount. And so I embed the servo motor model. So that you know basically block diagram on the left gets put in on the right, and that one over BMS is a is a re reduction. If you take control systems, you get into that. We're not going to get into that here. Um, but this is this is how you give it a you know, and the VC I think is typically a voltage input, um, and you get out a flat angle. And then position feedback says, yeah, okay, um, <laughs> I want to make sure I've got flap angle right. Okay. 
So this is the um, <clears throat> that's a feedback control system for flat. Now <laughs> let's get even more complicated. So that was just a I'm a, I want to send a command to a flap to go to a certain angle, and I want to make sure it gets executed the way it's supposed to be. All right. Now <clears throat> I'm looking at a control system where I want to control a state of the airplane. Okay. In this case, I want to I want to control the pitch attitude. Basically, this is the pitch angle. This is the the angle the nose makes with the with the horizontal. It's nose up or nose down. Okay, that's the pitch angle. All right. So I want to set that angle. So now I'm not con just controlling a particular component of the airplane. I'm controlling the entire airplane itself. All right. So I want the pitch angle to be a certain thing. Well, notice I've got the if I look at these loops, I've got the elevator servo. I've got a rate gyro for that, and then I've got a vertical gyro on the outer loop. See, the, the input is the pitch angle I want. The output is the pitch angle I actually have. And so I get that from a vertical gyroscope. We'll talk about that later. Um, but that comes in. There's an, actually an amplifier just to make the error signal bigger so that you have more to work with. Um, so then the error goes into the controls for, you know, the elevator, which is going to help basically set the pitch angle. <clears throat> and so there, there are other details there. Um, so what comes out of that? So okay, so the inner loop, so that that inner loop there, the elevator servo produces elevator deflection delta e. Now when you deflect the elevator, you get a pitch rate. You don't get a a pitch angle. You get a pitch rate due to the elevator deflection. So um, so you compare that, you, you know, <clears throat> you measure that with a rate gyro and figure out if it's the commanded value. Then that gets integrated. <clears throat> 1 over s in the frequency domain is integration. Multiplying by s is differentiation. Dividing by s is integration. So if you integrate pitch rate, you get pitch. So that's the theta dot times 1 over s gives you theta. And there's a vertical gyro, um, which measures theta and compares it to the desired value. Okay. So these are the control systems that, you know, that basically have to be modeled for an airplane. And then they become part of that autopilot control. So when you start writing the software for the autopilot, you're basically giving it, you know, telling it how to talk to these kinds of things. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And so we're again, we're not going to get into, you know, that's that's the most detailed I'm going to talk about <laughs> feedback control systems um, in terms of their analysis. <clears throat> now I'm going to talk about some of the some of the devices that are used to measure those quantities. And so that's what we're going to talk about for the basically the rest of this lecture and then part of the next one, um, these control systems. Now, as we've seen, you know, that earliest control system in the history of the UAS lecture, that earliest control system was hydromechanical. There were air jets, there were air pistons, there were oil pistons, there were no electronics anywhere, right? <clears throat> now everything is pretty much digital, uh, even fly-by-wire systems. The older aircraft, you always had a cable connecting the control thing in the cockpit, whether it was the stick or the rudder pedals or whatever. <clears throat> there was a physical cable which connected that directly back to the control surface. So if I pull back on the stick, that means the elevator comes up because a cable pulled it. Well, of course, when you get to bigger aircraft, that becomes difficult <laughs> because the control surface is so big and the control forces are so big that you got to do something about it. So there are boosters. There were hydraulic boosters for some time. Now there are fly-by-wire systems. Basically, when you pull back on the stick, you generate a signal, an electrical signal that goes to a motor that then moves the uh, the flap. So there's not a there's not a cable or you know a bar or anything. It's a it's a it's an electrical signal. That's a fly-by-wire system. So all of these. <clears throat> Unmanned aircraft controls and autopilots are, are digital control systems, and they're programmed for complete flights from takeoff to landing, the point I've made before. You know, 
Push a button, takes off, lands, does everything. <clears throat> now, if you're telling the airplane that it needs to do something and you need to know what it's doing, well, you need some sensors, all right? In particular, if you're trying to locate the airplane and tell it to go certain places and then find out where it is, <clears throat> then you need these particular systems. So the Global Position System, GPS, um, this actually should be the inertial measurement unit. There are two things, uh, two terms that I tend to use interchangeably. I think I meant to correct this and forgot. The inertial measurement unit consists of accelerometers and rate gyros, and we're going to talk about those in this lecture. Those are often combined with some of these others and the GPS into what's called an inertial navigation system, INS. So you have an IMU, which is just the accelerometers and rate gyros, inertial measurement unit, and then that's combined with other stuff to form an inertial navigation system. Uh, magnetometer, uh, which is um, a way to measure heading, because uh, pretty much the airplane, from an aerodynamic point of view, it doesn't matter which way it's flying, okay? It matters going up or down or whatever, if you're turning, banking, but if it's flying straight level north, or straight level east um, with no wind, it doesn't care. <laughs> okay, flying north is the same as flying east in terms of the aerodynamic response of the aircraft, as opposed to like climbing or descending or turning or whatever. So it helps to have an additional way of measuring heading, and that's done with a magnetometer. Pressure sensors, they can be used to al obtain altitude and airspeed. We'll talk about those. Um, and then sometimes you'll have other sensors. Um, you'll have an ultrasonic sensor or sonar to measure distance off the ground. Sometimes there's a laser altimeter, which basically measures how close you are to the ground. When you put all this together, you have what I talked about a minute ago, the inertial navigation system. Okay. Now in this lecture, we're gonna talk about the GPS and the IMU. The next lecture, we'll talk about the others, the magnetometer, pressure sensors, and so forth. All right, so first of all, GPS. All right, GPS basically allows you to locate essentially the, the center point of the airplane. And we'll, we'll talk about why that's an important distinction a little later. Now, so you have a GPS receiver on the airplane. How does it figure out where the airplane is? Okay. Well, it precisely times signals sent by GPS satellites. There's this constellation of GPS satellites that are orbiting the Earth, you know, different times, different locations. Each satellite, and it varies depending on which system you're looking at, but most of them, once per second, it will send out a message, and that message will have the time the message was transmitted and where the satellite was when it sent it out, basically at once per second. Some, some of them is uh, four per second but most of them I think it's just once per second, all right? So you have a receiver, <clears throat> it, it you know sees that satellite, it gets that message, it says, okay, some seconds ago, it sent the signal and it was here at that particular time, okay? Now, so think about that. If you receive that signal, now that signal, that radio message is gonna travel at the speed of light Okay, and we know that. So if you know when it was sent and you know when it was received at your location, then you know how far away the satellite was. And you know the center of the satellite, you know the, where the satellite was located, all right? That basically defines a sphere because any point on a sphere of that distance away from the satellite would get the same information and have exactly the same information, all right? So I'm on one side of the sphere, and the satellite's in the center, and I get this message from the satellite, and I know how far it is to the center. If I'm any other point on that sphere, I think beach ball or whatever, if I'm any point on that other sphere, I get exactly the same information. All right. So if you have one satellite, you basically have located yourself on the surface of the sphere, <clears throat> which means you need three. Okay. All right, so the, the black dot in the center of this figure is the receiver, right? 
And what you're seeing there is the, basically it's at a given instant, the receiver has received um, signals from these three satellites. Okay, they're, so they're different locations, they're different distances away because the radii are different. Okay, but this instant, so, so let's think about this for a minute. So one, one um, satellite gives you a sphere. You're somewhere on that sphere. So these look like circles, but they're actually spheres, okay? Three-dimensional spheres, all right? If you've got two satellites, well, think about, so, so you get information from two satellites. Well, you have to satisfy both of those. So basically, you have the intersection of two spheres, okay? And whenever two spheres intersect, you've got a circle. So that blue, what looks like an ellipse in the middle of the picture, is actually a circle, you know, viewed in perspective. All right. So that is the, every point on that circle is at the same distance from both satellites, okay, that are centered at their location. So one and two, for example, uh, that blue circle would be all the points that that are the same distance from satellite one and satellite two at that instant. We got a circle, all right? If you add a third satellite and it's positioned properly, then where that circle intersects the sphere of the third satellite gives you two points. Okay, so that blue circle where, where it's intersected by the sphere from satellite three is two points, all right? And one of those two is gonna be the actual location. Okay, there's a little bit of ambiguity. Now, you know that the solution has to be on the Earth's surface, right? You know, that's something else that you know, so that, that helps. Um, and the green circle is the Earth's surface. So you have to be somewhere on the Earth's surface, right, uh, to use the system. And so <clears throat> where the three spheres intersect basically gives you two points. If you then recognize you're on the Earth's surface, you, get a, you, you decide between those two. Now, what actually happens is you have multiple satellites. Okay, because think about it, you're, you know, you might be getting, you're getting the signals at a particular time, but you know, they're being transmitted at slightly different times and the satellite has moved a little bit, you know, between the time it transmitted and the time you received. So, so there's a little bit of, of a noise, of uncertainty, all right? So you have multiple satellites. You might have, you know, we have an exercise that when I teach, when I do the Unmanned Aircraft System Summer Institute, we do an exercise where we take a GPS, a handheld GPS unit out and put it on the ground and, and get locations. Uh, and, you know, usually it's four or five, maybe seven satellites that it can see. And so what happens is you, the more satellites you have, you basically minimize the error. You find the solution that basically minimizes the error among all of these different satellites. So the more satellites you have, the longer you can sit there and get updated readings, the more accurate it is. Okay. Now it turns out the other the other case here is that if you have um, four satellites, you get the position without the ambiguity, and also you get a very accurate clock because of the way the system works. Okay. So this is how a GPS works: the satellites broadcasting, the receiver doing all these calculations now. So say, okay, I got a satellite over here that you know thousands of a second ago transmitted and got a satellite over here and you know so it figures out all the distances and it basically solves this set of equations um, so that you can get the, the positions all right now this is actually um, an inertial navigation system we're going to talk about the accelerometers and stuff here in a little bit this is a, a company called Xsense. it basically combines all this stuff into an INS, so that orange box there is basically the INS. And you see how big it is in the lower picture. The uh, kind of oblong thing in the back, uh, the black object, that's the antenna. So we have, on the RS-16, we have two of these. We have, well, we have two antennas. We have an X-Sense uh, INS, like you see in this picture, on the payload. And there's a <clears throat> antenna specifically for the payload. Then the, the Piccolo autopilot has a GPS antenna that provides input to the autopilot. Okay, so the, the Piccolo, all the INS stuff is built into the autopilot. Okay. This is a standalone INS system. Okay. 
and we use it to, to tag the image location of the data. Okay. That's why we have one specifically for the payload. Then there's a separate INS in the Piccolo that actually determines where the airplane is. Okay, <clears throat> so the GPS gives you location of the aircraft, but it basically only gives you the location about once per second. All right, and we when we fly the RS-16, um, we're flying at you know something like 80 feet per second, and so between signals we have moved 80 feet. Well, you can you can see where that could lead to some drift. So what we we need something that will will update more quickly in between, and so that's what the accelerometers do. Okay, now <clears throat> accelerometers have been around for a while, but what is special about them now is that they are made as what are called microelectromechanical systems or MIMS. That's what MIMS means, microelectromechanical systems. You see the photo here, we're looking at stuff on the order of microns. Okay, that high, entire image, now micron is one times 10 to the minus six meters. Okay, so it's, it's small, it's basically you know, etched on the chip kind of thing. But that means you can do all this stuff in very, very small packages, which is why we can do autopilots. We'll get more into that a little bit later. All right, so this particular one, the way it works is you have a, a basically a centerpiece that's a mass, and it has these thin um, pieces on the ends, and those are basically springs. If you move this thing back and forth, it will try to come back to its original location. And then there's a basically a measurement finger that sticks out between two fixed outer fingers. Okay. So what happens is this thing is <clears throat> this thing is attached to a base, the airplane or whatever, and that accelerates. All right. Well, if you accelerate something, there's inertia. Okay. If you're riding in a car and someone steps on the gas, what happens to your head? Well, it jerks back, right? Well, it's not actually jerking back. It's the fact that your body is in contact with a car, has been pushed forward, and your head hasn't caught up yet. So from your perspective, it may feel like it's jerked back, but actually what's happening is your body is jerking forward and your head just hasn't caught up. Well, that's what happens here. The base gets accelerated. This mass takes a little while to catch up, and so the spring deflects. And when it deflects, if you're trying to measure the voltage between these fingers, well, the bigger space, you now have a higher capacitance. The smaller space, you have a lower capacitance. That change in capacitance can be measured. It will produce a change in voltage. Okay. And so you get an output that's proportional to acceleration. Okay. <clears throat> and I probably should have gone ahead and <laughs> moved to this slide. Um, so as I say, the proof mass deflects from its neutral position relative to the frame of the device. Okay, and this actually should be the, the red points in the figure. Um, for accelerations much larger than the corresponding natural frequency of the device, because remember this thing's a spring, so if I were to go in there and pluck it, <laughs> I had a really, really small tweezer, and pluck it, it would oscillate, okay, so it would have a natural frequency. If the acceleration corresponds to a frequency that's much larger than that, then <clears throat> the acceleration is basically directly proportional to the relative motion between the mass and the frame, okay? Or the relative motion between the mass and frame is directly proportional to the acceleration. Um, then you can measure that deflection, okay? Most commonly, the capacitance between a set of fixed beams and a set of beams attached to the proof mass is measured, providing a voltage output that is proportional to acceleration, okay? Now, acceleration is the second derivative of position with respect to time. If you integrate acceleration once, you get Velocity, if you integrate it again, you get position, okay? Now, we'll talk more about this a little bit later, but what tends to happen is that um, that can lead to drift. Um, that <clears throat> if you're not updating that, then if you're, just, if you're just measuring the accelerations and you're integrating it twice to get position, that can lead to error. Okay, because you just don't have updated information. But we're going to talk a little bit later about how the, the GPS and accelerometers interact. Okay. 
Now, we're also interested in the orientation of the airplane. Not only do we want to know where it is, where the center point is, but we also want to know if it's banked, if it's pitched, okay, <clears throat> anything like that. Because remember, I talked about in, in the, for the R16, the camera is fixed to the airplane. So when it takes a picture out the bottom of the airplane, or if it's banked, then the picture is not of the point immediately below the airplane, but it's off to the side, okay? So we need to know, all right, well, how much was it banked and how high were we were so we can figure out where on the ground that picture was made. Well, this is the way we measure that. Um, and again, we're talking about a MIMS device here, and there's something called the Coriolis force. force. <clears throat> and it's proportional to the angular velocity of an object. So if you're, say you're on a merry-go-round, okay, and you're standing to the center and you walk to the outer edge, all right, well, you're going, you, you, you know, you feel the force kind of pushing you back toward the center. Um, that's the, what's called the centrifugal force, but that's the one pushing you back to the center. You feel that even if you're sitting still. Okay, if you're standing on the outside, yeah, it feels like you're being flung off, but that's really the force pushing you back in. All right, we won't get into that. But if you're moving, if you're walking out from the center to the edge, not only do you feel that force toward the center, but you also feel a force to your side. And there's a force kind of trying to pull you off one direction. Okay, That's what's called the Coriolis force. But you have to be moving. Okay, this is, if you, if you do dynamics course and those chapters at the end that we never cover have to do with rotating coordinate systems. Or if you're talking about a coordinating, rota uh, rotating, coordinating system, then you wind up with this force, and you see the expression for it there. But you have to be moving. If you're just standing still, you don't feel this force. You only feel it if you're moving, all right? We can make use of this. All right, so if you look at this upper picture, again, this is a MIMS device. So we have a mass. We have something in it that causes it to oscillate back and forth, okay? So that's the velocity part, all right? It's moving back and forth. Now, if you try to rotate this thing while that mass is moving back and forth, so in the drive direction, as referred to here, okay, so there's a something that's causing that mass to move back and forth, well, that's providing the velocity. If you then try to rotate it, it's going to feel a force perpendicular to that direction, and that's what's referred to here as the sense direction, okay? Anytime you have a mass that feels a force, there will be, you could set up a spring, there'll be displacement, and you, and you can measure the displacement, and that will give you something related to the force, which will then be related to some other quantity, okay? Now, we've already seen that the force is related to the angular velocity, that's omega, and the linear velocity, that's V, right? Well, if I know V because I'm shaking the mass back and forth, and I know F because I've measured it, from this formula, I can back out omega, which is the angular velocity of whatever this thing's attached to. Okay, so if I'm spinning this thing, okay, and I'm shaking it back and forth, if I start to, that's the V part, that's moving in and out, then I try to rotate it, well, there's gonna be a force perpendicular to V that I can sense, all right? And so then the bottom picture is a, um, basically an implementation of this. So you have the dry fingers, you have the resonating mass, that's basically shaking it. You know, that's being shaken somehow, go, moving back and forth. And then if this whole thing rotates about its axis, there will be a corresponding tendency to move, which will be picked up by the Coriolis sense fingers. And then you can calibrate that to, to back out what the actual angular velocity is. If you know that, you can integrate it once and get angular orientation. So you can figure out that angle. Okay. All right, so this is the, the math behind all that. <clears throat> the accelerometer will give you, if you have three of them, it will give you the three components of acceleration. Okay, You integrate those once in time, you get the three components of velocity. You integrate again to get the three position coordinates. All right. Now, you get that kind of instantaneously, you know, as fast as you can sample the system and integrate. But it tends to drift, okay, it tends to 
if you if you're only because there's always error or noise or whatever in in the measurements, so and that error will tend to build up, and so you get drift. You're not going where you think you're going. Well, that's when you bring in the GPS. The GPS comes in ever so often and says, "No, you're here." Okay, and then the INS corrects that, or the INS is corrected. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, I thought I was here. I'm here. All right. But then between that time and the next time that the GPS comes in for that short time, but not zero, the INS can do a pretty good job of keeping up with the airplane is. All right. And so it, it may be drifting a little bit, but not a whole lot. And then boom, the next GPS signal comes in. All right. Now I know where I am again. And so, so the combination of the two basically gives you an accurate updated um, location of the airplane. All right, the rate gyros, okay? Those devices we just talked about are gonna give you the, the rates, the rotation rates about the three axes. You integrate those once, you get the angular orientations. You get the roll angle, pitch angle, yaw angle, all right? So now I know the position of the aircraft, basically the, the GPS and the INS, uh, the IMU give us the CG location. And then with the rate gyros, I also know I can get information about the orientation. If it's pitched, yawed, rolled, or whatever. Okay, well, I've gone a little bit over. Um, I kind of got verbose at the beginning of that lecture. Um, the next time we'll talk about the other sensors I listed, the magnetometer and all that stuff, uh, and then we'll look at how they get put into uh, different autopilots. Uh, so that will be the lecture two in this unit.